Well, good morning, ladies. Would you open your Bibles to the book of Romans? We're in chapter 1. We're going to, by God's grace, tackle that latter part of it. <laughs> um, my name is Melanie Brown, and I am so honored and privileged and delighted to be with you this morning. I love when I have the opportunity to come, so thank you so much um, for having me. I love this ministry. I began Bible study here 20 years ago, and I remember that well because I came with a baby on my hip. He was just old enough to where I could um, deliver him to the children's ministry, that awesome children's ministry that still exists up on the hill today. I'm so grateful for those ladies. I'm still friends with them today on Instagram, Michelle and Aaron. <laughs> and um, it was that one day of week that I lived for. It was that day that I got to take off my sweats, right? Because as moms, that's our uniform. We wear sweats every day. Take down my bun and actually put a little makeup on, get dressed and gather and fellowship with other like-minded women. And I'm telling you, the same way I loved it back then, it is the delight of my heart even to this day. I love being in Bible study. And you know what I've discovered? Is that when you're in a systematic Bible study, um, going through the Word of God like virtue does, where we are opening God's Word and we are studying it chapter by chapter, actually book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, right? You're going to realize that it's going to cover everything that we need to know to live this life. It's all there. Um, we liken the Word of God to like a blueprint in which we build our lives. I know that's how I've tried to build my life, is on the Word of God. It's like a compass that helps us to navigate through this life. How many of you have teenagers? Raise your hand so we can, yes, we can all identify with one another. What would we do without the Word of God, right? We need this Word to help us navigate, especially those years. I've heard it said that the Word of God is like a fire that purifies us. It's a hammer that convicts us, a lamp that guides us, a sword that cuts, ointment that heals, water that washes, food that nourishes, and gold that enriches. And I'm sure we can think of a few more things to add to that, right? The Word of God is so precious. I want you to write down 2 Timothy 3.16, and I know you ladies know it because you are women of the word, but I read it in the Amplified Version, and I just loved the expansion of it because this truly is the definition and the purpose of God's word. And this is what it says, that all scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration. This book is not man-made. This, this book is God-breathed. God gave us this word. And it's profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error, and for restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness. That's what we're sitting under in, um, today in God's word. And I hope that's why you're here today too, to be exposed to God's word. My prayer is that not only would he anoint my words, but th that he would anoint your ears as well. That when you hear the word of God, those of you, and I'm looking out and I see a lot of mature uh, women who are grounded in God's word, you're the pillars, you're the women we look to, you know, I pray that this year as we go through the book of Romans, that the Lord would refresh you, that he would bring revival to your heart um, out of these very many uh, may, maybe familiar passages that you've already read, but that you would just get that, that fire, you know, back in you. And you know what? I pray for those who are the newer believers among us, those who are baby Christians that have come, that you would not be intimidated by this letter, but that you would find your footing and that you would get your foundation as we go through this word together. So it is for all of us. It's going to benefit all of us. I want to ask you a question before we actually get into to Romans. And um, you know how you've got that wonderful lesson? If you would turn to the back where you have taking where you take your notes, I want to ask you a question. I want you just to put something on the very top, okay? And I want you to fill in this sentence. Finish this sentence for me. God is 
And I want you to fill that in with who God is to you. God is, put in one of his attributes, one of his um, characteristics. Okay, there's no wrong answer. So go ahead and just write that down. And everything in me wants to make this like an opportunity for us all just to declare God and yell out what we wrote, but I'm going to use restraint. But this is what I'm going to ask. Group leaders, when you go into your discussion time this morning, would you begin, before you ever start your lesson, would you begin, just take one or two minutes and go around that circle and have your ladies share who God is to them. Let's start with the time of adoration and praise. Because I believe that when we see God in his rightful, right perspective, in the right perspective, then we're going to see ourselves rightly. When we see him in light of his holiness, we're going to see ourselves and our sinfulness. And that's where we need to start this morning. If you are a note taker, I've broken down my message into four points. And the first one, we're going to look at God's revelation. Then we're going to move to man's rejection. Third, we're going to look at the result. And fourthly, our response. But let's first look at God's revelation. Do you know how God revealed himself to Isaiah? Do you remember in Isaiah chapter 6? God allowed Isaiah a peek into the heavenlies to see a vision of who he is in his glory. And Isaiah says that I saw the Lord and he was seated on a throne, high and lifted up. And what that means is when, when the Lord is seated on a throne, it's talking about his royalty, his majesty. God is a king. He's our king. And he's high and he's lifted up. High, that speaks of his transcendence. That means he is above all things. And he is sovereign. He is over all things. And then Isaiah says that he hears something. He hears the angelic beings crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy. God is holy. He is not like man. He is set apart. The Lord talks about, that word means he's got authority. And um, the Lord Almighty speaks of his power and strength and his omnipotence. Now, when Isaiah gets a glimpse, a revelation of who God is, what is his response? His rightful response. Doesn't he cover his mouth and he says, woe is me, meaning I'm done. I'm, I'm, a, I'm like a dead man. Woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell within a people of unclean lips. See, in light of God's glory, of his perfection, he sees his own sinfulness and he recognizes that. Isaiah's revelation of God allows him to recognize his own sinfulness. The more we see God as glorious and holy, the more we will see sin as something to despise and to weep over. Do you remember how God revealed himself to Job? You know, Job was suffering, and he had a lot of questions. He wanted God to explain himself, explain why he was enduring the things that he was enduring. And instead of God giving Job an explanation, he gave him a revelation instead. And then he, he asked him a series of questions. And he asks Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who keeps the sea in its boundaries? Who tells the mighty waves where they need to stop? Who sends the rain? Who directs the constellations? And at the end of this revelation, Job repents, and he stops challenging God's wisdom, and he's humbled under God's greatness. He was repenting not of the sin that his accusers were accusing him of, but he was repenting for the presumption that he knew more or that he was thinking that he knew better than God or that, or that God was unfair or unjust or unaware of his circumstances. See, that's, that was the repentance that he had. He came to the same conclusion found in Isaiah 55, 8 that says, God's saying, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. 
Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, that word repentance is not only turning away from sin and turning to the Lord. That is repentance, but it also means agreeing with God. And I believe in these next few chapters in Romans, we're going to be moved toward that same response. We're going to see our need for repentance, and in humility, we're going to turn toward him. Last week, we, re we received a thorough introduction of Romans 1. And if you didn't catch that first message that Tiffany gave, I just um, want to implore you to go on the website because everything's archived at virtue.harvest.org. But that first, um, that first week's lesson, we were introduced to Paul. We knew the heart of why he was writing this. We knew who he was writing it to, the church in Rome. And we really left on a high note, didn't we? We left declaring verse 16 that says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And we were, we were taught that salvation means rescuing. That word salvation that the Lord has offered to us means he's come to rescue us. And perhaps Paul was anticipating how maybe some of the people might respond when they heard that message. Maybe they didn't think they needed rescuing. So Paul takes the rest of this chapter to make it perfectly clear that we all need the message. In verse, uh, verses 18 through 32, Paul is basically, you know what he's basically doing in these verses, and you probably could hear it in the tone? He's taking all humankind to court. And he's making a case against all of us that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. Because if we don't receive the good news of the gospel, then there's going to be bad news. And the bad news is the wrath of God. And we're going to be talking about that in just a minute. But this good news, the gift of salvation, it's given to us by grace through faith, but it needs to be received not just because we want God's blessing, his forgiveness, the peace and security and comfort that comes with it, which we do want that, but sometimes we come to God to meet our felt needs. And sometimes the appeal to come to Christ is so that we can experience peace and that we could have purpose in our lives. And don't get me wrong, he will give you peace and you will have purpose, but that's not all of it. This is not a salvation. This is not a plea that can be resisted. We have to receive this because if we don't, we're going to be under God's wrath. Now, when you hear that word wrath, what do you think of? Probably what wrath means, right? In, in the di dictionary, it means like anger. Um, it could mean like rage or an expression of fury or an outburst of anger or maybe like you're out of control. And maybe some of you are thinking, ooh, that sounds maybe like a bad um, parenting discipline that I've had in the past where you get so frustrated with your kids and you show them the wrath of you, right? Okay, that might be the world's definition of wrath, and you can find that in Webster's Dictionary, but that's not the biblical understanding of wrath. God's word says that God's wrath is divine judgment against sin. And you might want to write that down because it's important. God's wrath is divine judgment against sin. It's a controlled, settled, and determined response of a holy and righteous God against sin. So would you read with me in verses, we're going to start verses 18 through 23. We're going to look at, we just saw the revelation, now we're going to look at our rejection, point number two. So let's read verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. So when we read this, the question is, why is the wrath of God revealed? And maybe in your translation, why is the anger of God? Why is God angry? It's because we've suppressed the truth. Suppress means to hold something down, to conceal or hide, or to not admit something. Now, can I give you a really super silly example of how I've suppressed um, things in my life? Um, I used to really enjoy going to the Cheesecake Factory and each time picking and choosing a new type of um, cheesecake, you know, to try, until they started writing down, listing the calorie count. Now, who in their right mind can eat a whole piece of cheesecake without guilt? Okay, I'll tell you how you do it. You suppress that information. What you do <laughs> is you take your thumb <laughs> and you strategically put it over that thousand, you know, that, that, that number thousand, where that's how many calories you're going to be eating. And when you get that stomach ache, you just ignore it when you've eaten a whole piece and you haven't shared with your friend. And then the next day, you just don't weigh yourself, okay? <laughs> That's how you suppress the truth. And what Paul is saying here is that we have suppressed the truth about God, that God has revealed himself in creation, but we've suppressed that even though there's evidence all around us of his existence. God has made himself manifest, visible, obvious for all to see. We can just look up and declare with the psalmist. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. When you look into a telescope and you observe the stars and the planets, you quickly recognize that God is transcendent. That means he is beyond ordinary limits. And you see order and you see design. And honestly, ladies, I never considered the heavens and all of that. Uh, you know, I guess I just get so wrapped up in what's going on in my own life. But it wasn't till I taught a unit in uh, social studies. I used to be a first grade teacher. And there was a social studies unit on the solar system. And it wasn't until I was teaching my little six-year-olds. I learned so much when I taught them. It's amazing. I don't know where I was at school, but I learned it all over when I had to teach these kids. But just the precision and the perfection of even planet Earth, you know, where we live that if we were any closer to the sun, we would burn up. And if we were any farther away, we would freeze. And yet the Lord has planet Earth where we live just rotating and orbiting around the sun. And it's on this perfect, invisible um, uh, you know, pattern. And it's not like we're the only ones out there. There's a whole bunch of other planets, and we're not running into each other because of this perfect gravitational pull. And you know how the um, Bible describes that phenomenon? It's in Colossians 1.17 that says, He has created all things, and he holds it all together. That's the explanation. And I'm going to tell you why this ministers to me personally. Because the God who can hold the universe together is more than qualified to holding my little world together. Amen? Amen. And the same God who speaks and the galaxies, you know, come into existence is the same God who speaks to my heart when I cry out to him. He's that big, he's that transcendent, and yet he's that close and he's that personal that he can speak to each one of us. Jeremiah 29, 13 says that you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Paul says that creation is God's evidence of his existence. He's given us general revelation. That's what this means. When Paul is saying you look around, you know that there is a God. Now, this isn't... The inf this isn't, this general inf um, revelation is who he is, but it's not enough to save us, but it is enough to prompt us, to propel us forward, to find out who this God is, okay? And that's why he says no one has an excuse, because God has made himself available, that if we will seek him, we will find him when we search for him with all our hearts. So we're not without excuse. We're without excuse. Verse 21, it says that although they knew God, 
they were conscious of his existence, but they did not glorify him. They didn't worship him as God. And ladies, that's why we were created, to know God and to glorify him, to recognize who he is and to worship him because he is so worthy of our worship. And if we don't, then we're not fulfilling the purpose in which we were created. We also glorify God by our agreement, agreeing with everything he says, especially about himself. In Isaiah 42, 5, God declares, I am the Lord God. I created the heavens. I made the earth and everything that grows on it. I am the source of life for all who live on this earth. So listen to what I say. So we must agree with God, but agreement isn't enough. We must also submit and obey. It's like, it's like when you tell your kids, your room is dirty and you need to clean it. And then they repeat back to you, yes, my room is dirty and I do need to clean it. Okay, well, that's nice that you agree, but it's not until you submit and you actually obey and clean your room, right? That's what God's looking for. Not just lip service. Yeah, you're right. You're God. But what is it that you're requiring of me, God? Verse 21 says that they weren't thankful. They didn't appreciate or acknowledge God's goodness. I don't think there's anything worse than an ungrateful, entitled child. Do you agree, mothers? Right? Okay, and I think we all try to teach our kids, you know, to say please and thank you and to have that heart of gratitude. I know that um, when my son was little and he asked me for a cookie, I said, well, you can have a cookie, but you need to say the magic word. And he thought about it and he said, abracadabra? <laughs> okay, I was looking for please, but... Um, we want our kids to say please, to say thank you. I've always told my kids the importance of writing a thank you note because when you say thank you, you're acknowledging the goodness that has been given to you, right? And shouldn't we do that to the Lord too, be thanking him continually? And there's so much. If we would stop, I mean, we can thank him in the morning for a, giving us a new day. We can thank him in the evening for bringing us through the day. We can thank him for even our hardships, that he's with us in them, and that he is working things out according to his purposes. We can thank him for our health. I know every time I leave the gym, I thank the Lord that I didn't just get hurt. Because when you have, you know, when you're prone to injury, you're just thankful that you can exercise. You know, you can be thankful for your health. You can be thankful even in the midst of sickness that God is your healer, God is with with you. He's brought others to come alongside you and to encourage you. You can be thankful that you're here in Bible study, learning under, you know, learning his word. There's so much to be thankful for. And yet we see here, because they've disregarded God and they su suppressed him, they're not, they didn't have thankful hearts. And then it says they became futile in their thoughts. They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And don't we see this rampant today? People have rejected the God of the Bible and have replaced that truth with a God of their own imagination. And it's common to hear people say things like this. I believe in a God who's good. I can believe in a God who's loving, but I can't believe in a God who is judgmental. But if they really thought about it, can God really be good or loving if he doesn't judge evil and sin? I mean, think that through. Their foolish hearts were darkened. You know, people can believe that they can just follow their hearts and their hearts will guide them on the right path. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that our hearts are deceitfully wicked, that we can't trust them. And when we reject the light of Christ in our hearts, then that void is filled with falsehood. Verse 25 says, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. An exchange took place. Instead of taking hold of God, they traded God for a lie, which begs the question, what's the lie that they traded in God for? The lie is a deceived heart. It's the replacement of God. It's when man rejects the true God and substitutes a God made in his own image or imagination. It's the lie that deceived Eve back in the Garden of Genesis when she believed that she could be like God, knowing good from evil. 
It's the lie that says we can redefine what God has already established. God has revealed to us what is good and right and acceptable, honoring and glorifying to him. See, it's his job to reveal it, and it's our job to receive it. We need to love what he loves, and we need to hate what he hates. Unlike the changing opinions and beliefs in our culture, God and his word is unchanging. They're unchanging. Isaiah 48 says, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. And Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I was talking to a young girl who just uh, rededicated her life to Christ. And, you know, those of us who um, are a little bit older in the faith and there's someone who comes to Christ, like we're so excited and we just want to like pour every, all our knowledge into them, right? Because we're so excited that they're starting on this journey or they're, they're back on the path. And I was just telling her, I couldn't overemphasize enough how important it was for her to read her Bible, to pray, and to surround herself with friends, with other like-minded um, young women that she could um, grow in her faith with. And as I was encouraging her, I was thinking to myself, these are the same basic Christian disciplines that we all need to be practicing, even when we've walked with the Lord for years. It's so important just to continue reading your Bible, praying, surrounding yourself with other like-minded believers, right? For extra credit, those of you who, who want an extra credit assignment, read, <laughs> all of you because you're all students of the word, um, would you read Psalm 119 this week? Because you know what? It's, it, the psalmist, it's, it's a song, it's a poem about how the psalmist is in love with God's word. And when you read it, ladies, it's going to make you fall in love with God's word. And I know I've said this so many times in the past, but I think... I want to say it again, because I believe it with my whole being. The more we know God, the more we will love him. And the more we love him, the more we will obey him. And the more we obey him, the more we will be changed and transformed into his image. That's how it happens. But we have to fall in love with the word of God. And the Bible also says, you know, we won't know the will of God until we know the word of God. Does that, do you see how that, um, that those go together? We need to know the will, the word of God in order to know the will of God. So we've talked about his revelation. We've talked about man's rejection. And now our third point is the result, the result of rejecting God. And we're going to finish our reading, um, verses 24 through 28. Verse 24 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in, their lust, in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, For this reason God gave them up, you might want to underline that, to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. In verses 24, 26, and 28, there's a phrase that's repeated, God gave them up. What does that mean? When we have defied God and we've, we've abandoned him in his ways, we've in essence said, we don't want to go your way. I want to go my own way. And you know what, ladies? We have that free will. God's given us that choice. 
And so he lets us go our own way. God gave them up or God gave them over means that he lifts that protective restraint and allows us to face the consequences of our sin. In my mind, I see two paths. I see a path that at the end of that path says life. And on that path, it's paved with grace. But then there's another path. And at the end of that path says death. And it's paved with wrath. And the Lord's giving us that choice. Which path are we going to choose? Which road are we going to travel on? He offers us grace. He says, take this road. Forsake your sin. This is a holy highway that I want you to travel on. Yet we insist on going our own way. And we don't want to repent of what God requires us to forsake. But just like the father in that story of the prodigal, we might go our own way, but the Lord never burns that bridge for us to come back, to turn around, to repent. You know, these verses we read about talks about uncleanness, lust, dishonoring our bodies, vile passions. Paul is addressing sexual immorality and homosexuality. God has given us the gift of sex. It's his creation. And he's also made it clear how it should be expressed. And that's within the covenant of marriage between a husband and a wife. And it's in that context that we can be assured of God's blessing. The Bible is clear that fornication, that's sex outside of marriage, adultery, sex with someone other than your spouse, and homosexuality is considered sin. Now, it's not the unpardonable sin. Unbelief is the unpardonable sin, but it is sin. But ladies, let's not disconnect the context of these verses. Paul has made his case that when we refuse to acknowledge God and we reject his authority, we will substitute God. We'll substitute him for a God of our own making. We'll make a God out of ourselves in his place. We'll decide what's right and wrong, good or bad, moral or immoral. And as a result of us taking that place that only God deserves, what what happens is it distorts every aspect of our lives, our thoughts, our behaviors, our attitudes, our actions, our relationships, even our sexuality. Let's be honest, in the climate of our day, these passages are really hard to hear, and they're even harder to speak. But guess what? They were just as difficult in Paul's day because Rome was rampant with sexual sin. And the church there was facing persecution. And I think the church in America is starting to feel that persecution as well. And as Christians, we are called to be set apart, to be in the world, but not of it. And our stance on this particular issue will certainly mark where we stand. So don't be surprised. Don't be surprised by the resistance, by the pushback, by the hostility that you might face. Because Jesus said, you will be hated for my name's sake. You'll be hated for my name's sake. But it's important that we are not hateful. I had a very candid conversation with my daughter. And I really wanted to hear her perspective. She's a teenager. Um, she's a believer. And I just said, you know, what, 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 the, what is the feel out there? from? What's the perspective from your generation? And she says, Mom... Your generation looks at homosexuality very different than ours. You know, um, she, she says that our generation, that Christians are against homosexuals, that, uh, that it's like we have a phobia against them. But she's being bombarded with the message that it's just an alternative lifestyle. It's, it's just natural. That's how, that's how one is born. And so this is the message, you know, the climate of our day. And they're being bombarded on all, on all fronts, social media, the movies, videos, music, even in classrooms. You know, that is what 
that's what we're you know, um, up against right now. And I think it's important to have these conversations with our kids and to continue to speak truth. I didn't interrupt her when she was talking to me and telling me what her, you know, what the perception was because I wanna have an open dialogue with her. I want her to be able to speak to me, but then I need to be able to speak truth as well. Because this is the thing, ladies, sometimes we think, oh, we can't be speaking or we don't wanna overwhelm anyone by our thoughts or our opinions. But the truth of the matter is the world's not gonna stop speaking and spewing their perspective Perspective, right? So we can't stop speaking what God's truth is. Amen? And I just want to say this too. You know, I'm sure in a group this size, we've all been touched by this issue some way, somehow. And this is what I would say to all of us is to hold the standard. Hold the standard because that's God's standard. But continue to love and to pray, okay? Because that's what we need to do as Christians as well. And, you know, I feel like I'm being affected, too. I go to the gym several times a week, and on my instructor's playlist, I know every single word to Lady Gaga's song, I Was Born This Way. Now, not that I wanted to, but that's what I'm being exposed to. And I can understand it's a, it's a, it has a good beat to it, but the words, if you really listen to the words, it's indoctrination. And I just want to read you two lyrics of this song. She says... To be who you are is not a sin, capital H-I-M. Did you catch that, Christians? Okay, she's, when she says capital H, that's how, she's referring to God, right? That's how we write the name of God with the capital. Do you realize that she's saying the exact opposite of what the Bible says? Because the Bible says that we are all sinners, capital S-I-N, right? And then she goes on to say, um, I'm on the right track, baby. I was born this way. And this is the why we need to know God's words, lady. God's word is because it's the Bible that's going to define what sin is. It's the word of God that says what the right track is. It's the word of God that's going to tell us when we're off track. And it's the word of God that's going to get us back on track. We need to saturate ourselves with the word of God so that when we hear things that are against God, we can stand up and say, no, that's not right. The Bible tells us that we are not to be conformed to this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we might know what that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is. And again, we can't know the will of God unless we know the word of God. And that's how our thoughts will be transformed. You know, I was reading in my one-year Bible just this morning. How many of you read the one-year Bible? Such an awesome way to um, just get through the Word of God. And just this morning, in October 11th, it says, This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. See, we need to continually take in the word of God because we might know these truths, but we need to continue to hear them, read them, meditate on them, and then put them into practice, be obedient. I want to close with our last point, our response. You know, we're sitting here under the authority of God's word. It's been opened up to us, and that means that we're now accountable for everything that we've read, everything we've heard, and everything that the Holy Spirit has been stirring in each one of our hearts personally. And if you're feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, don't suppress that. That's actually a good thing. Respond to him. I want to leave you with a few application questions that I felt the Lord was requiring of me after I read this chapter. And I want to pose them to you as well. The first question is, am I going to agree with God and stand with the Bible, or am I going to follow the dictates of this world? You know, God's word is a firm foundation, unlike the shifting sand of this changing culture. And when my views don't line up with the word of God, what am I going to do? Ladies, we need to make that decision right now. That when our views, our ideas don't line up with the word of God, what are we going to do? We're going to change our opinion. And we're going to stand with the word of God. And the second question is, am I more concerned about being rejected by the world or being accepted by God? Sometimes we can be so worried about offending people. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't be sensitive, we shouldn't be careful. But ladies, what about offending God? Shouldn't we be more concerned about offending him? 
When I found out what my scripture passages were going to be that I was going to be studying, I read it to my husband, and he prayed this over me. He's, he was praying that I would be sensitive and bold. And I loved that prayer, and I've been praying that over myself every day that I've been studying. And I'm going to pray that over you. We need to be sensitive, but we also need to be bold. You know, we get to the end of this chapter, and we read verses 29 through 32, and there's a list of unrighteous acts. And we read through them, and we recognize that we are all guilty. We've all engaged in one of these sins at one time or another. So what are we to do? We fall on the grace of God. We repent of our sin, and we receive his forgiveness. I'm going to share something personal with you. Um, as I was typing my message a few days ago, I got to this point, and I didn't know how to end my message. Now, my word count was at the place where I knew I needed to end. I knew my time was going to be over, which it is, and I didn't know how I was going to end. And in my office, I just got on my face before the Lord. Helpless, so needy, so dependent, so submissive. And I said, God, you need to show me. I do not know how to do this. And it was in that place of just kneeling before the Lord that I felt his voice just whisper in my heart, Melanie, that's how you end, because that's the posture that I'm going to respond to. That's the posture when we submit under his authority. And so I want to end with just praying over all of us. So would you pray with me, ladies? Lord, we might be sitting in pews this morning, but our hearts are bowed before you, recognizing that you are a holy God. Lord, you have revealed yourself not only in creation, but in your word today. We want to respond by not suppressing the truth, but by glorifying you, by giving you the praise and worship that you're so worthy of. We agree with you, and we submit to your authority over us. We want to be women who are thankful, that have renewed minds, and don't entertain futile thoughts. We do dethrone anything, any thought or imagination or false idol that has taken your place of supremacy in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your salvation, that we are no longer under your wrath or judgment because of Jesus. Amen.